Good evening. I am Kim Mack, Chair of the 1st Congressional District of the North Carolina Democratic Party. Thank you all for joining us this evening as we honor the legacy of Congresswoman Eva Clayton, celebrate the service of Congressman G.K. Butterfield, and support Don Davis for his bid to Congress to represent us in Congress with the 1st Congressional District. At this time, I would like to recognize all the elected officials that are present. Will you stand to be recognized and please share with us your name and office that you hold? Thank you. Will all candidates running for office that are not currently an elected official please stand to be recognized at this time and share your name and office you hold? Will any Democratic Party chairs present please stand to be recognized and share which county you belong to? My, my name is Natalie Best, uh, Acting Chair, Eshcorn Democratic Party, Eshcorn County Democratic Party. And my name is Marcus Williams, third Senior Chair of the Eshcorn County. Thank you. Thank you for attending. At this time, we're going to get ready to introduce our first um, speaker of the evening. Reverend Dr. Thomas L. Walker has been a lifetime advocate for the people. His role as minister of the gospel has afforded him the opportunity to serve humanity at the very basic level. For over 50 years, he has served as senior pastor of Ebenezer Missionary Baptist Church which is where we're located tonight. Since his election as pastor, he has erected a 1,000 seat community-based church situated on four acres of land in the heart of the city. As a community leader, he is known as a mover and a shaker, one who fights for the rights of the common man. He is a political activist who works diligently to institute changes for the betterment of the people. He was elected as one of the first black commissioners in Edgecombe County, and he has served three consecutive terms as county commissioner and several years as field representative to Congresswoman Eva Clayton. He currently serves as the chairperson of the Edgecombe Nash Political Caucus and Pride, people really interested in developing equality. He is the past president of the Greater Rocky Mountain Ministers Council and the North Carolina Martin Luther King Jr. Commission. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a round of applause as Reverend Dr. Thomas Walker comes to the podium to give opening remarks and invocation. Thank you very much and praise God for this opportunity. I would like to extend to each of you a hearty welcome on behalf of the Office of the Member of the Baptist Church and uh, the elected officials, even though I'm not elected now, of uh, the surrounding areas. Um, I want to say very briefly that I'm honored that you chose the uh, Children of the Baptist Church as a place to, to meet. And we know we'll never be the same without uh, having had this experience. Uh, I want to say very much, uh, I am a uh, have politics all in my bone and I will get started. Uh, but this is a very, 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 very serious election for our people to be chosen. And we're going to please stand for a uh, word of prayer. Lord, 
Lord, we thank you for giving us each other. We thank you for bringing us together. We thank you for the scheduled meeting uh, this evening, and we know that your presence is with us. And we don't want to assume uh, that uh, we have covered uh, all of the necessary inspire inspirational things we need to do to assure that. So we ask, Lord, that you let your spirit move from heart to heart, from breast to breast, that you bless every uh, person here, especially those that we come to pay special tribute to in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Reverend Dr. Thomas Walker, and thank you to Ebenika for hosting us tonight. We will, now, we will now hear remarks from the Honorable Shelley Willingham, who represents Edge Home in Northampton County in the House of Representatives. He has been their representative since 2015. Representative Willingham. Say, I would just, uh, you might not tell it on my face, but I have to say what I feel. You know, I travel around the three counties I just, just uh, mentioned uh, today and yesterday, and from watching the people come out and talking to me, uh, people recognize that this is something special that's happening. And the people also recognize that we have some special candidates. They recognize that, you know, we have an opportunity. You know, to continue something that started a while back, and we're proud of that. I remember times when I remember when uh, Congressman Clayton, Congresswoman Clayton ran, and uh, she has always supported me. At one time, I had a district that we could cover Halifax County, and uh, she's always been behind me and she's been a great supporter, and she was a great representative. And then, of course, uh, taking that tradition. Only other representative we've had uh, has done that. And of course, our recent representative, uh, who's still serving now, comes from TK Rutherford. Uh, what can I say? You know, we, we, we're proud of him, and uh, this is the legacy that we certainly are going to keep. We want to keep the first and Western District uh, in town. And the only way we can do that, of course, is elect a federal candidate for that position, uh, John Davis. And I, again, I'm just so proud to be here because all of these people here I look up to, I, I admire them. And I, I've been, I've learned things from them and I'm still learning. And I know that they're sincere in what they're doing. I know that they're sincere in representing us. And I've never called on any one of them that they have not responded. And I think this is the kind of thing that we have to look forward to, we can look forward to in our new so, let me just say that I, I appreciate you coming out, uh, and I'm, I'm sure, again, as I said on many occasions, you know, when you show up, you know, we're kind of like talking to or preaching to the choir, but at the same time, what you have to do is be disciples. Go out and gather the folks. You got to make sure that those folks who are not here, you know, get involved. And, and I'm, I'm just going to say this one thing, and I'm going to sit down. I was in Tarma at the voting site today, and a young lady uh, was going in to vote, and one of the co-workers asked her, said, you know, this is a simple dollar for blank. She said, uh, let me say it. She took it, and she looked at the co-worker, and she said, do you, what make you think that I will vote for anything that will support blacks? This is what she said to uh, the co-worker. It's a young lady. She and he, you know, looked at her and said, wow, he said, you know, you guys just, yeah. She said, I wouldn't do anything. She said, I'm a Republican, and I, I wouldn't do anything to support anything that would help blacks. I mean, and I tell you this, you know, it 
kind of hurt me, one thing, but at the same time, I was not really that surprised because we have so many people on the other side of the world running so far out there. You know, it should make you afraid. And that's what, you know, we should go out and we should make sure that uh, we don't let these people in these places because if they're in there, you know, we got a problem. We got big problems. So, just little things like that. But we have an opportunity to make sure that that does not happen. And I have confidence in you that, as far as this race is concerned, I know that we're going to be successful, John Davis. And so I'm saying to you, you know, keep the good work up and uh, make sure you get your friends and family out to vote because this is the most serious election we've had in a long time. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Willingham. Next, we will invite Natalie Best from the Edgecombe County Democratic Party to come forward and give a brief greeting and say hello. Good evening. Again, my name is Natalie Bess. I am the acting chair of the Edgecombe County Democratic Party, and we thank you all for coming here to support our candidates, support our support our area, and we ask that you do all that you can. We are doing all that we can to make sure to keep Edgecombe County blue. And if there's anything that you all can do from us, we will definitely be here to support. Thank you, Natalie. Next, we'll have Jocelyn with the Beasley campaign to come forward and give remarks. Thank you, Kevin. Good evening, everyone. Let's try that one more time. Good evening, everyone. Better. My name is Jocelyn Bittman Blatt. I'm an Air Force veteran. I'm an attorney at the law firm of McGuire Woods in Raleigh. But most importantly, I am a wife. I'm a mother of two hilarious toddlers. And I'm a volunteer on Sherry Beasley's campaign for the United States Senate. So, first, I want to thank Pastor Walker for calling um, and inviting us to speak this evening. I am obviously not the incomparable and magnificent Sherry Beasley, but she wanted me to make sure that someone from our team participated in this important event. Um, she's at an event right now with Governor Cooper in Raleigh, but she sends her warmest remarks to you all, and she sends me. So before I talk about Sherry, I need to uh, tell you my connections to two people on this stage. So first, Senator Don Davis. Um, he is someone who I know has demonstrated his commitment not only to our country, but to North Carolina, and specifically to Eastern North Carolina. And as a fellow Air Force Academy graduate, I'm so proud to support your candidacy. And to attend the Air Force Academy, you have to get a congressional nomination. And I received my congressional nomination to the Air Force Academy almost 20 years ago from Congresswoman Eva Clayton. So thank you, Congresswoman Clayton, for starting my military career. Okay, Sherry Beasley. Please don't tell her I talked about her before. Um, okay, so I met Sherry in 2017 when she helped me get my first job as a civilian attorney, which was clerking on the North Carolina Supreme Court for then Justice Barbara Jackson. And she quickly became a mentor to me as she has to so many young people throughout the state. I admire so many things about Sherry. Her integrity is unwavering. Her insight is keen and her leadership is unshakable. To me, she is a true public servant and it shows in everything that she does that she is proud to serve the people of North Carolina. I know several of you here tonight may know her personally, but for those of you who don't, I just want to tell you a few things about her. She and her husband, Kurt, raised their twin sons in Fayetteville, North Carolina, in a home steeped in faith. And they passed on the values of hard work and integrity. Sherry's commitment to hard work, integrity, and justice has guided her work, first as a public defender and then as a judge. And then in 2019, Sherry rose to become the first African-American woman to serve as the Chief Justice of the North Carolina Supreme Court. 
And throughout her time serving North Carolina, Sherry has always acted with independence to uphold the law and to keep communities safe in the matter of the politics. So let me just take this moment to say that those fear-mongering ads are misleading, exaggerated, and sometimes flat-out false. Sherry has spoken to folks all across North Carolina, from our smallest towns to our biggest cities, and people are struggling. They've been telling her that costs are rising, and we know this, that families are working two jobs to make ends meet, that folks are rationing life-saving medications just to pay the rent, and they're wondering how they're going to keep food on their tables and take care of their families. So North Carolina families need a senator who will put their needs over corporate special interests, and when Sherry Beasley is in the Senate, she will do just that. She'll always put the people first and fight for North Carolina families, and she'll lead with the same values hard work, integrity, and justice that have guided her life. Now, y'all, there is too much at stake, like Representative Willingham said during this midterm election to sit this one out. Ted Budd, and that's the one and only time I'm gonna say his name, and Republicans in the Senate have already shown that they will not put North Carolina families first. North Carolina is a top 2022 battleground state, and I know we can win this, but it's gonna take all of us and I need each and every one of you when you walk out of those doors tonight to become ambassadors for Sherry Beasley. I need you to tell your family and friends and colleagues and neighbors about her. Tell them that these ads are exaggerated and in some case flat out false and remind them to vote. Early voting, as you all know, is happening now. You can register to vote at the same time as you vote if you do so during the early voting period, which ends November 5th. Sherry's proven she can win statewide and she's in a strong position to win North Carolina's US Senate seat. And with your support, we can get it done. And I want to end on a personal note. So I told y'all that I'm an attorney, I'm a mom, I'm a veteran, and I'm active in my community. But the reason I got out of the Air Force is that I was diagnosed with a sleep disorder. I have narcolepsy, and I was medically retired, which means I have a hard time staying awake. So to drive the hour 15 minutes down here to be here with you this evening, I actually have been spending the night because I don't have the energy to drive back safely. Um, but I tell you all that not to elicit praise or pity, but to tell you how much Sherry Beasley means to me and to tell you how important this election is. Cory Booker, Senator Cory Booker was campaigning with us in Charlotte two weeks ago, and he kept reminding us the importance if he just had one more vote in the United States Senate. He kept reminding us what that would mean. The vote from Sherry Beasley from North Carolina could mean raising minimum wage. The vote from Sherry Beasley from North Carolina could mean codifying Roe versus Wade. And the vote from Sherry Beasley from North Carolina could mean restoring the full force of the Voting Rights Act. So friends, I want to leave you with a quotation from a friend of Congressman Leatherfield's, the late Congressman John Lewis. Get in good trouble, necessary trouble, and help redeem the soul of America. Thank you. I know many of you in this sanctuary know the Honorable Eva Clayton, but let me share with you again why she is so remarkable. Eva Clayton is the first African American woman to represent North Carolina in Congress and the first black representative from North Carolina since 1901. Come on. It took 90 years before a majority minority congressional district, also known to many in the state of North Carolina as counties that were in the Black Belt, to have an African American represent them in U.S. Congress. The Civil Rights Movement energized Eva Clayton to become active in civil and political affairs. In 1968, she was recruited by civil rights activist Vernon Jordan to seek election to Congress, but her bid was unsuccessful. Although she did not win her election, her grassroots work made an impact by increasing the black voter registration and participation. Some people lose elections. They disappear. They give up. But that was not our Eva Clayton. She continued serving our community, region, and state through public and private ventures. She worked with the North Carolina Health Manpower Development Program at UNC Chapel Hill. 
1974, she co-founded and served as the executive director of the Soul City Foundation, a housing organization that renovated the complicated buildings for the use of homeless shelters and daycare centers. Eva also worked with Jim Cut, excuse me, Eva also worked with Jim Hunt on his campaign for governor, and we all know how that story ended. He won. Afterwards, she was appointed Assistant Secretary of the North Carolina Department of Natural Resources and Community Development. In 1982, she founded an economic development consulting firm and became a Warren County Commissioner and chaired the commission until 1990. When Representative Walter Jones announced his retirement, it was now her time. She had the experience, knew the residents, understood the workings of state and local politics and economic development. In her oral history interview I found online, Eva shared the following regarding her campaign trail. She said to people, I have a record. I have demonstrated to you that I care. I just shared with you what I did for this state. I care about rural areas. I care about Harvey. I care about you. Unfortunately, Representative Walter Jones had an untimely passing that left the congressional district without representation. Eva Clayton to many was not even considered a favorite to win. Remember, there had not been a black person to represent Congress from our district since 1901. But Eva had been working. She knew the district, the people, and its needs. She fell short to her opponent in the primary, but the opponent did not have enough to win outright. Now, the primary results show she had 31% of the vote while her opponent had 38%. All those grassroots skills was put into overdrive because in the runoff, she was victorious. That's very good. She secured the support of the others in the primary that were opponents, and she won 55% of the district to her opponent, while her opponent won, was lost by 45%. Eva was seated for the remaining two months in the 102nd Congress. She defeated her Republican opponent in her upcoming election to join the 103rd Congress and was re-elected for another four terms. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a, rouse, a, a round of applause and please stand to your feet as we welcome the Honorable Eva Clayton to the podium. <laughs> On behalf of the 1st Congressional District, we present her with a dozen of pink long stand roses. Thank you very much. I, um, I'm reminded of something of uh, uh, a colleague of mine, a dear friend who's passed on, her name is Karen Lutz. He said to me, um, he was one of those dry Presbyterians, but she won't be long, right? So I'm, I'm not going to be long with But I do want to, the two words came to my mind when I was preparing for this. And one word is gratitude, and the other one is fight. I am grateful to God first, but also I'm grateful to the people of the First Congressional District who rallied around my campaign. By the way, there is, you know, we didn't have to raise the money, much money for God, we had to raise God. If we had to, I'm not sure, I would have been elected to be honest with you. But you work with what you have, right? And the people of the First Congressional District not only gave of their monies, but they gave up their time, they gave up their passion, they gave up their commitment, and I'm grateful for that. And you're honoring me today as a legacy. Well, legacy has no value unless there are people to follow. You can open the door, but you open the door to have opportunities for us. So I'm grateful for people like you. Yeah. <laughs> 
He opened the door for people to not only to come through that door, but we could do better, right? And guess what? I'm grateful that I've gone baby. Presenting himself that he can do better. I'm grateful to Willing and all the people we have touched. And many of you out there. I'm, I'm grateful that they told me that I had a cancer. That's the payoff. Is there anything else? The title doesn't mean anything. It's what to do for people. The other word I have is fight. I don't know why hate is more contagious and more energizing than love. The Republicans are energized. Hmm? For those of us who say we are righteous and on the right side of principle, we don't have that fight. What, what's happening? Where, where is the energy for those of us who care about policies that lift up people? Hmm? And now I don't think I'm going to pass on the next few hours, but I remember Paul in 2 Timothy said, I have finished the race. Hmm? I've done the good fight. I've kept the faith. But tell me, you here are all Sit in mind because you wouldn't come out to work tonight. But I'm saying to you, where is that fight in you? Huh? Where is the fight in you that we need new recruits? Hey, see, this 88 years old woman can't do it now. Huh? And you who are 60 and young 70s, huh? and young 50s, huh? we need some young recruits. Where in the World of the army of those who care about justice, hmm? who care about good health, care about education. Where are they? Well, I'm praying that today you will energize yourself to go out and get those recruits. Hmm? It's not enough to complain how bad Trump is, or how bad, what's his name, that woman named Green? Monica? Or how bad Bud is, right? That's not enough. We know they're evil. Where's your righteousness? <laughs> so you want to get, you want to honor me, honor yourselves, uh -huh. honor your commitment to justice, honor your commitment to equality, honor your commitment to yourselves. Huh? We will not win this election unless people get out to vote. I don't care how many people are in there. Please, we thank you. We thank you for the service you've done. And we challenge you, God, to be behind you. But to be behind you in words is not enough. We have to get our grandchildren. Friends, maybe we'll get some enemies, people you don't talk to too much, to tell them this is election. It's more than just election about individuals. It's really election about democracy. Mm -hmm. We won't have any good health care if we don't have democracy. Mm -hmm. We don't have any good jobs if we don't have democracy. Mm -hmm. Please know the significance of not only you voting, but getting everyone. Thank you, dear God, and thank you for the people. Thank you for the honor. Appreciate it. The next person does need an introduction. And he reminds me from when he comes to Halifax Community College to keep his introduction short. <laughs> but I will remind you a few things about Congressman Butterfield. And we all know that he's a double eagle, graduating from North Carolina Central University. I don't know how many eagles are in the house tonight. Congressman Butterfield was elected in 1988 as a resident Superior Court judge. 
In his role, he presided over civil and criminal courts in 46 counties in North Carolina. For two years, he served in the North Carolina Supreme Court by an appointment of the governor. But if he retired from judiciary work after 15 years of service, when he successfully ran for Congress, he was elected to serve the first congressional district of North Carolina through a special election that took place in July 2004. In Congress, Butterfield has been a champion for the affordable health care, education, investments in rural communities, veterans, renewable energies, and federal programs that support low-income and middle-class Americans. Butterfield serves in the Democratic leadership of the Senior Chief Deputy Whip as Senior Chief Deputy Whip and is the past chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, the 114th Congress. He sits on the Influential Committee on Energy and Commerce, where he serves as a senior member of the Subcommittee on Health. In addition, he serves as a member of the Subcommittee on Communications and Technology and Energy. And since the 116th Congress, Congressman Butterfield sits on the Committee on House Administration. And as of the 117th Congress, he was appointed to serve as the chair of the Subcommittee on Elections. And on November the 18th, 2021, G.K. Butterfield sat in his hall when he announced that he would not seek re-election. And it was, it was a disappointment because we, for many of us, or at least for me in my adult years, he had been my representative. And that may be the same for many of you in this room. And so we're excited about our future and what our future will hold which we're planning on seeing Don Davis as our new congressman in 2023. <laughs> but we also want to be able to honor the service of Congressman G.K. Butterfield as well. So we're going to present to him a token. We have many more tokens to come. But we were thinking maybe in retirement, he'll be able to go out to dinner more with him and his family and his new wife. So... <laughs> If you're going to the podium, please, y'all, give him a round of applause. Stand to your feet. Give him a warm welcome. He deserves it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to see all of you this evening, and thank you for coming out to share this very special time with all of us. Uh, this is indeed a very special season. It's called election season. It's about this time that all the candidates and all the supporters of the Democratic Party get very nervous. And so thank you for coming out and calming our nerves this evening. It's good to be back in Ebenezer Baptist Church. Uh, this church has led the way in this community for as long as I can remember. And the shepherd of this house, Dr. Thomas L. Walker, uh, has been so dynamic and so visionary in his work in this community. And so I want you to join me in recognizing the shepherd of this house, Reverend Dr. Thomas L. Walker. I don't have the time to to illustrate for you everything that Dr. Walker's done for this community, but on another day when we celebrate his work, I just want to come back and, and, and give a chronology of what this man has meant to this community, what he's meant to me, what he's meant to this church, and what he's meant for this community. But I'm going to have to move on tonight and, and revisit that on another day. But it's good to see the representatives of the Democratic Party. Uh, thank you for the work that you do in your county and in your district. Uh, but some of our greatest work is yet to come, so thank you for the work that you do. And what can I say about Eva Clayton? I can make a speech about Eva Clayton, just like I could about Reverend Walker. I've known Eva since the mid-1960s, and let me tell you, uh, Eva Clayton has just been a dynamic, profound leader in the congressional district across the state and indeed across the country. When she left Congress some years ago, she didn't go home and sit down. Uh, she went to Rome, Italy and became an ambassador for the World Food Organization. And when I traveled to Rome, Italy, the first person I saw was Eva Clayton. And every time I go back to that part of the world, people stop me and ask me how she is doing. 
She made a profound impression on, on her work, in her work, and I just want to publicly thank her for her friendship and what she has meant to our state. Thank you, Eva Green. This election that's coming up in just a few days, I'm not going to say it's the most important election of our lifetime, and I've seen my share of elections, but I am going to say it's the most consequential election of our lifetime. There's so much at stake in this election. You know that we have a Democratic president, we have a Democratic Congress, and we are legislating, we are doing good work in Washington, not as much as we want to do, but we are doing great work and we plan to do more. The problem is that we can get legislation passed out of the House of Representatives because we have a working majority in the House, but where we come short is only in the United States Senate. You may think it takes 51 votes to get a, a, a bill passed in the Senate, and that is technically correct, but it takes 60 votes in order to close debate in order to get ready to vote on a bill. And so that has been the hiccup, that has been the, 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 the pushback that we've received uh, over the last two years. We do not have a working majority in the Senate. And that's why the Senate race is so incredibly important. We have a 50-50 United States Senate. When there's a tie vote, Vice President Kamala Harris must come over and break the tie. But very seldom do we have tie votes because many of the bills that we pass in the House send over to the Senate, they do not have the 60 votes available in order to close the debate. And so that's why it's so critically important that we pay attention to the Senate race and to understand that the eyes of the nation are watching us here in North Carolina because we have a real opportunity to elect Sheriff Beasley to the United States Senate. The real opportunity to do it. Sherry has put together an impressive resume. She has a coalition in North Carolina that consists of, of, of minority groups and women's groups and LGBTQ groups and young people and seniors and all of these different groups that she has put together as a coalition. And let me tell you, she is within striking distance of winning this election. And so that's why we've got to make sure that we have her on the top of our minds when we go out to vote. And, and, and this is a turnout election. The, the polling data demonstrates that most people have made up their minds. What we've got to do is to get them out to vote. We just have a very small number in North Carolina who are considered to be undecided. What we need to do is to get those who are decided, those who will vote the Democratic ticket and get them out to vote. So many, so many Democrats now feel that that uh, this election is not important, that they want to wait until 2024 in order to vote. But we've got to make sure that we turn out in this election. Now let me talk about my favorite subject this evening, and that is Don Davis. And that's why, that's why I've come to get into, to preach to the choir and just talk about the incredible importance of, of getting Don Davis elected. First, I thank you for 18 years of service, I came to you in 2004 and asked you to support me in that election. I received an overwhelming vote on July 20th of 2004. The next morning at 10 a.m., I was sworn into Congress. Typically, you don't get sworn in the next day, but the seat was vacant. The seat was vacant, and 750,000 people were without representation. And so the leadership in Congress demanded that I get there the next morning and get sworn in. And now it is 18 years later. I've been able to do so much for the district. I've just been, been just working every day, seven days a week, overtime. And now it is time for me to take a step back and pass the baton to someone who is well qualified, who is capable of carrying this work forward. And so I'm delighted that Don Davis has stepped forward. Uh, Don Davis has, uh, will be uh, the eighth African-American congressman, as I count, the eighth Af African-American congressman in the history of the district. And some of you look a little confused, and I want to tell you about that. The first African-American who was elected was from Eva Clayton's home county, Warren County. The year was 1872. His name was John Adams Hyman. Right after the Civil War, 
right after slavery ended. African American voters became very active and, and, and participated in every election and turned out and elected an African American in 1872. And after Hyman left office, another African American named James Edward O'Hara from Enfield offered himself. He became the congressman for the district. And when he left office, another gentleman from the Vance Grandville County area named Henry Plummer Cheatham. Cheatham became the congressman for the district for two terms. And when he left, the legendary George H. White from Tarboro became the congressman. These four men served in Congress during the period of Reconstruction. When all of that came to an end in 1900, when the KKK was, was running rampant in Edgecombe County and Wilson County and all across the South, they were lynching African Americans and anyone who wanted to talk about African Americans voting and becoming elected officials. And so in 1900, the North Carolina legislature passed a law called the literacy test that essentially kicked all of the African American voters off of the voter registration rolls. And so starting in 1900, we did not have any African American representation anywhere in North Carolina, and certainly not in the Congress. But in 1965, the Voting Rights Act was passed by Congress, and the Voting Rights Act is a very powerful piece of legislation. What it did, the first thing the Voting Rights Act did was to eliminate the literacy test. That same literacy test enacted in 1900. In 1965, 65 years later, Congress eliminated the literacy test and said to African Americans, you have the unfettered right to vote. And starting in 1965, African American voter registration began to increase. But by 1968, it was not increasing at the rate we thought it should be increasing. So what do we do here in Eastern North Carolina? We turn to a young, a young mother, wife, with four children at home, Eva Clayton. And we said to Eva Clayton, look Eva, you may not be able to win this election, but we need to stimulate and energize African Americans to become registered voters in Eastern North Carolina. And in 1968, she ran for Congress against a sitting United States Congressman named L.H. Fountain from Tarboro. She did not win that election, but because of her candidacy, because of her fight, and she talked about fight a minute ago, because of the fight, we increased voter registration by thousands of African American voters here in the district. And so I just want everyone to know that even Clayton's candidacy in 1968 was a stimulus that started us on our way. And so the Voting Rights Act had two other provisions, and I'll close with this, called Section 2 and Section 5. Section 5 said that any jurisdiction, such as Warren County, Edgecombe County, Nash County, Wilson County, any jurisdiction that has a history of discrimination against voting, before they can change any election laws, they've got to get approval from the Department of Justice. It's called Section 5. And so we use Section 5. We use Section 5 here at Rocky Mountain. We used it in Nash County. We used it in other places across the state. And we used it successfully. Now, when it was time for redistricting for Congress in 1990, North Carolina created a very weak congressional district that possibly could have elected an African American sent the map up to Washington for approval. The United States Department of Justice rejected the map and said, no, you have too many African Americans living in North Carolina. Not only should you draw a, a majority black district in the east, but you also have the ability to draw one in the west. And so because of Section 5, two majority minority districts were created. And that's when in 1992, uh, Eva Clayton was elected, this time for sure she was elected, uh, to Congress in the 1st Congressional District. And Mel Watt was elected over in the Greensboro and Charlotte area. So that was the power and the value of Section 5. And so that's why we were able to get the fifth African American elected to Congress from this district, Eva Clayton and Mel Watt. Okay.
okay? As time went on, we saw more litigation about the congressional districts. We saw that Democrats were beginning to pack, I didn't say Republicans, Democrats were beginning to pack African American voters into the first district. So they would not be an influence in some of the other districts. And when we looked up, Eva had 20, how many counties? 28 counties. The district stretched all the way down to Fayetteville and moved over to the Wilmington area and all the way up to Elizabeth City, a very large piece of real estate. And so we challenged that in court, and we did that successfully. And then after 10 years, Eva decided it was time for her to step back and do something different. And that's when our beloved Frank Bowers uh, ran for and was elected to Congress and served nearly two years in Congress. When Frank Bowers left Congress, that's when an opportunity opened up and I was able to win the election and now we're able to do this stuff. Right. So we need to continue the legacy that we've started. And I'm so proud of Don Davis. I know his background. I started off in Washington, D.C. this morning, so I'm a little tired, but I, I need to just conclude by telling you a little bit about this man, and then I'm, I'm done. Don Davis graduated from high school, and you know where he went? He went to the Air Force Academy. Only certain qualified, exceptional individuals get appointed to an academy. He was appointed to the Air Force Academy and graduated with honors. When he left the academy, what he decided to do was not go to New York, Chicago, Austin, or Houston. He came back to his hometown. Snow Hill, North Carolina. Coming back to Snow Hill, he decided that he wanted to do something different. He wanted to run for mayor at 29 years old. People told him not to do it. To wait for later, but he ran for mayor at the age of 29. Knocked on every door in Snow Hill, and he won that election. After winning, after winning that election, he then decided he wanted to run for the state senate. The state senate was not a blue district. It was not a Republican district either. It was a toss-up district. And so he decided he wanted to run for senate. No one believed that he could win that race as well, and he did. And now he's served in the North Carolina Senate for 12 long years. He is well prepared to serve us in Congress, and I'm just so delighted that he is on the ballot, he won the primary, and he's going to win this general election, and you are going to get him elected. And let's make sure Make sure that we have a 100% turnout in this election. Thank you so much. Thanks, Congressman Butterfield. I also believe in retirement, we might find or see him on C-SPAN or CNN as a historian. I believe that's his second calling, or maybe third calling. Next, we will have Hannah, the finance director from Don Davis' campaign, to come forward. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming tonight. As Kim mentioned, my name is Hannah Spangler, and I am Don Davis' finance director. Um, so, as it's been previously mentioned, uh, by Congressman Clayton, that we have to raise a lot more money now than we ever have. So I am here to remind you that tonight is also a fundraiser. Um, if you are able to give, please find, if you can raise your hands over there, staff members. Thank you. Um, you can come to one of us and contribute. You can contribute online. Um, you can fill out a remit. We also have t-shirts available. Josiah, if you don't mind holding one of those up for us. Thank you. They are $20. We're also going to have some yard signs available. And then after this program concludes, there will be food as promised. So we're going to head uh, after the program is over to the other room and enjoy some food together. So thank you again for coming and hopefully you are able to contribute. Thanks. All right, so we've been talking about Don Davis all evening, and he is no stranger to any of us. 
He's been the chair of the 1st Congressional District for 23 years. He has supported us through our local party issues, chair committees to find replacements in the legislature, mentored those seeking political office, and he understands the party's plan of organization as if he has written it himself. And I'm serious about that. If you had questions about the plan of organization, Don Davis is one of the go-to people in the state of North Carolina. Those that attend our district meetings can agree that Don is also a pro at Robert's Music Order. I believe that we have some of the best district meetings in the state. Knowing Don is a family man, I can also attest that a district convention, the district conventions are a family affair. His sons take part in the program and his wife is always nearby, assisting with technology or refreshments. We can all remember the babies and strollers. Because of the support of his family that has been given to him through the years, they are a part of our family too, because at almost every major district event, they're there and they're supporting him. We can recall Ryan graduating from high school, Justin getting his license here recently, and Kyler on the football team. I didn't know Don when he was an active soldier. Uh, we had an opportunity to meet once. Uh, he was here in Halifax County, and of course, not Halifax County, but working in the district as well as myself. But I do know Don is a veteran, and I appreciate his commitment to supporting our soldiers and our veterans. As G.K. Butterfield mentioned, and y'all know, he's a veteran of the United States Air Force, and he attended the United States Air Force Academy, where he served from 1990 to 2001. In many of my conversations with Don, I've asked, why did you not stay in the military and retire? And knowing him the way that we all know him now, I am certain to say that if he would have stayed, he probably would have retired as a general. However, Don told me that the reason why he left the military and he came back was because he missed his grandmother. The grandmother who raised him while his mother was in college, who instilled in him the values that have made him the leader he is today. And those values is one of the main contributing factors that we see his name placed on the ballot this, year, this November as the Democratic nominee for our first congressional district. And let us not forget that Don's grandmother had him working in tobacco fields to help make the ends meet with the electricity bills and having him attending church twice on Sunday. We all know Don's background, the youngest mayor of Snow Hill at the age of 29, six-term North Carolina senator, and the highest, second highest ranking uh, Democrat. Well, let me rephrase that. The second highest Democrat and the fourth ranking person in the Senate. He's authored over 90 pieces of legislation. He's a pastor. And he's a dedicated public servant that spreads goodwill. We all know that Don has fought for Eastern North Carolina, and we know that when we elect him in November, he will continue to fight and ensure that the voices of North Carolina and Eastern North Carolina in particular will be heard. So ladies and gentlemen, please rise to your feet. Please give him a round of applause as we welcome him to the podium for his comments tonight. Wow. Well, hello, Rocky Mountain and Expo County Hall is tonight. So glad to be with you. And let's give it up. I mean, this is a historic occasion, everyone. It really is, if you think about it tonight. Let's give it up to our first Congressional District Democratic Party Chair, Kim Mack. Thank you, Kim, for leading us forward. And let's not stop there uh, to our Edgecombe County Chair, uh, Bess, uh, Natalie Bess. Where are you? Let's give it up to Natalie. Here we go. Even on the NAS side, I see Sandy back there. Let's give it up. Let's give it up. And yes, of course, we kind of started a little bit of this. Even Clayton, everyone. 
And yes, the Honorable T.K. Butterfield. And to each and every one of you, let's give each of us a hand today. Well, I'm honored to be here today. And the reason I say it's historic is we must understand how we get here. And when I think about an Eva Clinton, I think about a champion for our farmers, a champion for small business owners. I think about a person who was fighting this fight. And I even understand, Mother Clay, that Martin Luther King Jr. was making his way here to North Carolina. But yet, he then was redirected, and we know the end of the rest of the story. But he was heading here to support Eva Clay. What a history. What a history. When I think of G.K. Butterfield, G.K. Butterfield, he was well in this fight, Rocky Mount, way before stepping foot onto the congressional grounds. Matter of fact, he was doing the civil rights work, fighting to make sure all of us all of us had the ability to elect our candidates of choice. And he was doing this work, along with so many others that we know so well. Jim Wynn, Toby Fitch, I mean that whole long list of names. What legacy, what legacy. And yes, we can't leave Frank Balance out of that equation. Oh God, Frank was just, he was ahead of his time. We talk about being concerned about criminal justice reform. Frank was doing criminal justice reform way back in the day. What legacy, what legacy. And I add to the equation that brings us here. Reverend Walker, Thomas Walker. I know, too, that you are a part of this community's legacy. And we thank you so much. And that work, see, sometimes we forget. The work of the church goes way beyond the walls of the church. And God bless you all, Ebenezer, for welcoming, welcoming all of us here today. My friends, as we come together, you've heard about my background. But I want to share with each and every one of you today. This is not about God days. This is about our families. This is about Eastern North Carolina. This is about our children, our grandchildren. This is about their futures. And I'm going to say it this way. We have a fight before us like none of We have a fight before us like none of This is a time too, and I want to be clear to the first congressional district in Eastern North Carolina, and I'm going to say it this way, we're old school and new school join forces. Because it's time for the next generation young people to step up to the plate and get in this fight for our families, for our children, for the future of Eastern North Carolina. This is what's at stake. And I'm asking everyone, let's join forces, all hands on deck, let's get it done, let's win this election. And I'm going to say it this way, the legacy of leadership here in Eastern North Carolina 
is at stake. You've heard it laid out before you today. You've heard it laid out. Congressman Butterfield laid it out. And to think that the living members, the living members will come and stand together and send a loud message to Eastern North Carolina. It's time for us to stand united and fight because we know how to take the fight and where we need to take the fight to. It's a time for us to fight for our children because adults are failing. That's the truth. It's time for us to fight to make sure there's great access to quality health care. We're fighting to help others, our friends and neighbors, just to live. And we're fighting, yes, for good pay, American jobs, right here in eastern North Carolina. That's right. There's so many things that set state. Social Security, Medicare, and we can go on. But here's the greatest thing that's before us. That's protecting our democracy. Protecting our democracy. Some want to make it tough for you to vote. Some want to lose elections and say they won. We must protect our democracy. And I can tell you what I know. And that is, every single time I was promoted, and hear this story. When I was sworn in in my church in Greene County, North Carolina, as a first lieutenant, who was there? Eva Clayton. And I put my hands up in the air. I, Donald G. Davis, who solemnly swear to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and that I take this. Um, this um, obligation without mental reservation, purpose of finish. And I said, these were words that were echoed every single time. Every single time we were reelected, took an oath to uphold the Constitution. And we have others right now who are trying to undermine. Our Constitution. Here's the deal. There's a legacy of leadership that's at stake. I'm picking up the Walter B. Jones, Eva Clayton, Frank Bauer. G.K. But who's next? Who's next? Who will be next? And I want to share it this way, if I may, in this way. I was talking to G.K. last year, and I'm just being candid. This was not on the radar screen. I was planning to run the state center. But when he said he was retired, I said, GK, no. I told him, no. I said, you can't retire. I said, don't worry about it. We have to back. And we'll do everything. But when he said these words, I knew he was serious. He said, it's time to pass on the baton. It's time now for the next generation to come forward. 
a little easier into this greater Easter community. If you've ever been to a track and you watch the four by four relay race, and you have people who are standing in the crowd, and the way it works, the runners take the blocks and they start. And you have someone like Eva Clayton, if you might imagine, running and she takes off. And she's running and she's running full speed, fighting just for us to take the baton on, to pass it to someone like a Frank Balance who's now he's running and he's running full speed to get it to GK. But this is how it works. The person who is standing ahead, they're standing in the curve. They're standing in the curve without the baton. And, and the way this works, you can't wait until the runner comes before you. But you have to look, and you're watching, and you're waiting. Come on, somebody. And you're standing and you're waiting without the baton, but here is how it works, everyone. When you see them hit a certain point in the track, you turn and you start running. This is somebody hear what I'm talking about today. You run without the baton. You're preparing. You're preparing for the fight, and you're running without the baton. And you pick up your speed. And now you're strong and you throw your head back because you timed it out. And you come back with the baton. And you continue to run in strong without skipping a beat. My question before you today, when I ask who will be next in this legacy, of Eastern North Carolina, will you run with me now? Run with me! Run with me! Run with me! And we're going to run all the way to Washington, D.C. And we're going to fight for our families. And we are going to bring back the resources that are due to Eastern North Carolina. God bless you all.
neighbors say. We thank you for all the candidates who are giving themselves to lift the level of humanity. We thank you for those who have served in the past. And we pray that as they reflect upon your faithfulness, that they will be encouraged for the future. Now bless this fruit that we may receive for the strength of our bodies. To your honor we pray. May the peace of God that passes all understanding Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. May the church say amen. amen. And many of you have not seen me since I got married, so I'm going to ask my wife to raise her hand over here. Amen. Please be telling me. My wife for four months. Amen. Thank you so very much. God bless you. We're going to the fellowship hall now. Uh, uh, some will be getting. Of course, if you want to be seated, you can do that also. God bless you. Thank you very much.